All right, so we're going to look at the British Restoration in the 18th century. Um, the time period is 1660 through 1785. We're going to start with the monarchy. Previously, Britain was ruled by Lord Protector, and this is Oliver Cromwell. The Commonwealth period lasted from 1649 to 1660, and this is when England, Wales, and later Ireland and Scotland were ruled as a republic. And this followed the Second English Civil War and the execution of Charles I. Remember, we spoke about Charles I. Um, he got his head chopped off. Um, Cromwell was an independent Puritan. He was generally fairly, fairly tolerant of other people's religious um, beliefs. Another thing Cromwell did is he defeated the Confederate and Royalist Coalition in Ireland, thus ending the Irish Confederate Wars. The Irish Confederate Wars were interesting. It was an 11-year war where the native Irish Catholics fought against the English and Scottish Protestants who came over to colonize Ireland, and they were in constant conflict with one another. Um, once this conflict ended and England kind of stepped in and took control of this, two issues arose and they were based on religion and basically who was going to govern Ireland. Um, would it be governed from England? Um, which ethnic religious group would own the majority of the land? And which religion would dominate the country? Would it be Catholic? Would it be Protestant? So the, a lot of issues were occurring in Ireland simultaneously while things were occurring in England. <clears throat> so after Cromwell's death, his son Richard Cromwell was his successor. However, he was a poor leader. He didn't want the job. Um, so... Charles II was brought back from France. His mother was Catholic, and she fled to France before Charles I was beheaded. So Charles II was protected. So they brought him back. And when they brought Charles II back to England to rule, this is what we call the Restoration, because it was the restoration of the English monarchy. So... Once this began in 1660, the English, Scottish, and Irish monarchies were all restored under one crown. And Charles II was Catholic. Um, so the term restoration is used to describe both the actual event by which the monarchy was restored and also the period of several years afterwards in which the new political settle settlement was established. Um, Next, historian Roger Baker argues that the restoration and Charles coronation mark a reversal of the stringent Puritan morality. When Oliver Cromwell was in power, he, although he was very tolerant of other religions, he was not tolerant of immoral plays. Um, he tried to heavily censor the art of the day, and so there was a lot of repression from the arts. So, after Cromwell came out of power, theaters reopened. Um, Puritanism lost its momentum, and the body restoration comedy became a recognizable genre again. Um, also, another addition is that women were allowed to perform on stage for the first time. So, um, that was a big deal. Religion. The Church of England was originally established by Henry VIII to supplant the Pope as the head of the church. Um, and this was restored as the National Church in England. And it was backed by the Clarendon Code and the Act of Uniformity, which occurred in 1662. And at this, people celebrated. They were reported as prancing around maypoles as a way of taunting the Presbyterians and independents. Like, have it you, I'm on dance in the streets. So. That was a good time, I guess. Religion. Christianity moved into three different directions. You had your traditional Christians. These guys maintained faith in scripture. They limited tolerance for those not of the Anglican persuasion. They had no quick dismissal of scripture scripture or political and social traditions. Great, can't read. And this group became the conservative Tories. These guys were defenders of state religion and existing institution. Now, next we have our traditional enthusiastic religion, and these guys are made up principally of more radical Protestants. So we have our Baptists, our Methodists, our Quakers, and these groups were called dissenters at the time. 
And then we have the modern Christians. And these guys recognized and accepted that the growing power of science was a way of reforming society without reference to religion or with decidedly less emphasis on religion. Now, the modern Christians became the Whigs, and these guys were committed to rational reform or subjecting religion to the demands of reason in the interest of improving society, increasing trade, and making the political system more inclusive. So the modern Christians were a bit more fluent in their beliefs. They wanted to accept science. They wanted to transform their religion to um, sort of adapt to the new scientific discoveries that were occurring. So I think that's interesting. Daily life. Again, just as before, we have a shift of a population from the country to the town. Um, And with this shift, we have a rising middle class of literate people with a significant amount of spending power and leisure. Um, New standards of taste were set by what the people of London wanted, and art joined with commerce to satisfy those desires. So becoming an artist, painting, theater, all of these things um, kind of became a profitable career at this time. Revolutions in science, we have the microscope and telescope. These open new fields of vision. And then Britain's expansion into an empire was fueled by slavery and the slave trade, a source of profit that belied the national self-image as a have no liberty and turn to British people against one another. Um, So at this time, a lot of our literary works will start turning to the idea that um, man cannot be owned by another man Or we have um, some people who believed that that was something that could occur. And so we have a lot of um, literature that sort of, hmm, I guess, goes back and forth with that subject. Um, But for the most part, a lot of your artists um, really hated slavery and thought that it was um, an inhumane practice. Um, Rising prosperity at home had been built on inhumanity across the sea. So... I mean, the fact that England was getting rich off slavery was very troubling um, to a lot of people at this time. And then lastly, we begin to see an increasing concern with public manners, how men and women ought to conduct themselves. So people are moved into close quarters. They start thinking, hmm, maybe I should act right. And so... We have etiquette coming from this time period as well. Restoration literature. The Restoration was an age of poetry. And not only was the poetry the most popular form of literature, but it also was the most significant form. Um, These poems affected political events. Um, It was often read in public. Um, A lot of times the king would have his own personal poet. Um, So it was an age dominated Um, not only by the king, um, but just the idea that art, literature, that it was an important part of society that we needed to incorporate it within our lives. So throughout the period, the lyric, aerial, historical, and epic poem, all of these were being developed and created. So it was a really exciting time for poetry. Likewise, we had prose in the Restoration period and is dominated by Christian religious writing. Um, But it also saw the beginning of two new genres. And these genres were fiction and journalism. Religious writing often strayed into political and economic writing. Um, As we've seen, you know, Protestants, Catholics, a lot of your political um, issues are tied into your economic issues as well. And who's going to run the country? Who's going to be in control of these things? Um, So... It's an interesting time. A lot of political um, fiction. And then, of course, we see the theater. So we have the return of the stage. Um, We have body comedies. We have um, once the Puritan regime is um, taken away, they're not allowed to censor the theater any longer. Your playwrights have more freedom. And a lot of drama is recreating itself. And also, women are now on the stage. So that was an exciting time as well. So that is the British Restoration in the 18th century.